you. The first item of business is portfolio questions. In order to get as many people in as possible, as you know, I prefer short, succinct questions and answers to match. Uh, first question, Sandra White, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with representatives of the Home Office to discuss the support that Scotland's local authorities require to support asylum seekers. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. The Scottish Government believes that the Home Office must fund all local authorities properly and equitably for the crucial role they play in supporting people seeking asylum. Local authorities in Scotland should not be treated differently to those in England. And I've made my deep concerns about this issue clear to the Immigration Minister in both meetings and correspondence, most recently at a Four Nations meeting on asylum on the 15th of October. Sandra White. Thank the Minister for that reply. Uh, whilst the Scottish Government stepped in recently to assist those asylum seekers facing destitution in Glasgow, uh, this has not been a permanent solution. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further information on negotiations with the Home Office regarding equity of funding for Glasgow City Council as a designated Home Office dispersal area? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, absolutely. I believe that we need a long-term sustainable solution to ensure that local authorities that are participating in asylum dispersal are properly funded and that people at the end of their asylum process are not faced lef left facing destitution and homelessness. And we'll continue to raise this issue with the Home Office. And we note that the Welsh Government and English local authorities have also made similar concerns known. And I'm deeply disappointed that the Home Office has so far chosen not to act on those concerns, leaving the Scottish Government, local authorities and the third sector to pick up the pieces and look forward to tomorrow's debate on this issue when members of the Parliament will also get a chance to raise their voices on this issue. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. I very much welcome the, the Minister's uh, approach on this and, and sincerity. Does the Scottish Government agree with the Glasgow Task Force that there is in fact no legal barrier to the use of public funds to provide emergency accommodation for those who in fact themselves are de designated as having no recourse to public funds? D does the Scottish Government agree with the, that, that position that there is Cabinet no legal Secretary. barrier? Well, certainly we have made what we've done is within the comp competency that we have is provide third sector partners with the uh, ability to help cope with those that are facing destitution. Most recently, I visited Positive Action in Housing and uh, provided additional funding to help them uh, cope with the influx of people they are having to deal with to cope with some of the decisions that have been taken uh, around uh, 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 asylum seekers in, in the city. But again, I go back to the point, this is about making sure that our local authorities are treated equitably and the Home Office needs to listen to that if they want to continue uh, seeing local authorities uh, to provide the homes for these people who are seeking refuge and asylum in our country. Polly McNeill, briefly, please. I agree with the Cabinet Secretary and Sandra White that all local authorities should be treated equally. And does the Cabinet Secretary uh, agree with me that forced destitution of asylum seekers already vulnerable um, is an inhumane policy and should be reversed? And will she give uh, the Parliament uh, some indication that uh, accommodation and particularly advocacy should be given to asylum seekers who have been refused asylum Cabinet by the Home Secretary, Office. please. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with the sentiment uh, and share that with what uh, Pauline uh, McNeill has and how she's articulated it. And again, I just underline that we already provide funding to asylum seeker services for asylum seekers living in Scotland to help avoid that destitution where we can. We're also providing an additional 130,000 to strengthen advocacy and, and advice services supporting people seeking asylum and those who are at risk of uh, eviction. Again, tomorrow's debate gives us an opportunity to flush out more of those issues. Question two, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support the development of better housing in Dumfries Town Centre. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government has allocated almost £88 million over this par parliamentary term to support uh, the delivery of Dumfries and Galloway's affordable housing priorities. This funding may contribute to the Council's aim to improve town centre living through its town centre living fund, which includes as a priority increasing the supply of affordable housing. We also support the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership and Specialist Empty Homes Officers to help provide assistance to return empty homes into use across Scotland, including in Dumfries and Galloway. 
Colin Smith. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister, I'm aware, has, has met with the Mid Steeple Quarter project in Dumfries. Their aim is to take ownership of disused buildings on our high street, refurbish them, uh, and create enterprise space, but also housing above shops. Does the Minister agree that this is entirely the type of community led fight back against the decline of our town centres the Government should be supporting? And then will he consider making it a pilot scheme backed by government investment so the Mid Steeple Quarter have the funds to buy back those properties? Minister. Um, President officer, I would pay a tribute to those active in the Mid Steeple Quarter group uh, and also those folks um, who have been involved with the Stove Network as a whole um, because I think that their community activism uh, is leading to change in Dumfries. Uh, and I'm very pleased at the Council uh, holding uh, an empty uh, homes uh, conference the other week, which I attended, and I know that Mr. Smith was there. Uh, I'm pleased to see that they are using uh, funds that they have raised from uh, council tax on second and long-term empty homes uh, to provide a fund uh, to ensure uh, that new homes within the town centre uh, of Dumfries become a reality. I will keep a, a close eye on this, but I would also ask other local authorities to look at what Dumfries and Galloway are doing here, uh, because I think that this kind of thing needs to be replicated elsewhere, uh, and I think others could follow their example. Uh, Finlay Carson, I'll let it stretch to Galloway. Uh, the Minister, I'm sure, will agree with me that it takes a combination of factors to create a vibrant and sustainable town centre for residents and businesses alike. The budget on Monday announced a package of rates relief for English high streets worth 900 million. We'd love to see something like this uh, in Scotland. No, I'd like your question. Does the minister agree with me that this type of policy would invigorate business and housing in town centres? Minister. Uh, well, here in Scotland, uh, we've had the small business uh, bonus for some time. Uh, what, 10 years, in fact, uh, which has seen businesses, the length and breadth of Scotland, benefit either from zero rates or from reduced rates. Um, and I think that uh, we have put in place a fair package of measures uh, to ensure that small businesses continue to thrive. Uh, beyond that, uh, we will work closely, as we always have done, uh, with Scotland's Times Partnership in promoting the Town uh, First Principle. Um, and, of course, uh, I will continue uh, to meet with people right across the country uh, to look and see where we can export best practice to other places to reinvigorate our town centres here in Scotland. Question three, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how the views of local communities are taken into account by ministers during the consideration of a planning appeal. Minister. Uh, President officer, our planning system is inclusive and the views of the local community are fully taken into account along with all relevant material considerations in reaching decisions on all planning appeals, including those of national importance where Scottish ministers will normally make the final decision. Lee McCarthy. Okay, I thank the Minister for that. Last month, the Orkney Islands Council rejected applications by Hulan Energy for two proposed wind farm projects at Hester in South Ronsey and Cost in the West Mainland, both giving rise to considerable public concern locally regarding potential impact on landscape, habitats, wildlife and amenity. Given that Hulan Energy have confirmed they are appealing the Council's decision, can the Minister explain what opportunity there will be for objectors to make their case to those in government responsible for considering the appeals? And what assurance can he give that the views of the local community will not simply be overridden in this process? Minister. Um, President Officer, obviously I can't uh, comment on uh, live applications uh, as uh, Mr MacArthur and other members know. Uh, a reporter has been decided uh, appointed to decide both appeals and is aware of the time critical nature of these appeals too. Um, all representations made by the local community on the pl planning application are forwarded to the reporter by the planning authority in order that they can be fully taken into account in the determination of a planning appeal. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Is the Minister aware that many of my constituents in STEPS have no confidence in the current appeal system, in particular following the Scottish Government reporter's decision to allow a planning application, which had been refused, but to allow it um, to go ahead to build on Greenbelt land at Horns Hill Farm, Gateside Farm in STEPS? And would he agree with me that we must value our Greenbelt areas, listen to the concerns of communities and respect local decisions? Minister. Um, President Officer, um, as uh, Ms Smith knows, I cannot comment on any ongoing 
application, any live application at all either. Um, but reporters are appointed uh, to take the views of all, including, as I've just explained to Mr. MacArthur, um, the views of communities. Uh, reporters work independently. Uh, they take account of the local development plan uh, and material considerations um, in coming uh, to their decision. Uh, they are independent, they do listen to communities, uh, and uh, I, I think that our system um, is a fair one in that regard, taking account of all views. Question five, Michelle Ballantyne. Scottish Government, how successful participatory budgeting has been since the introduction of the Communities Act? Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Supported by the Scottish Government's 6.5 million Community Choices Fund over the past four years, participatory budgeting has gone from strength to strength, establishing itself firmly in Scotland. Last year, over 70,000 people voted for the things that matter to them in their community, with almost 1,000 local groups securing funding. Participatory budgeting has been very successful in supporting the aspirations of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 by putting decisions about how we invest in communities into the hands of the people who live and work in them. Joe Ballantyne. I thank the Minister for that answer. I wonder if they are aware that the delivery of participatory budgeting is taking up significant local government officer time and therefore has a significant cost attached. So can I ask, what support will the Scottish Government therefore supply to assist with the ongoing delivery of participatory budgeting? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've just outlined that we've... Uh We've, allowed, we've supported this uh, with uh, significant resources and actually the decisions that people are, are making are better decisions not just for the communities themselves but also for the local authority and again we're kind of we're ensuring that we support local authorities through that uh, process we have seen participatory budgeting growing across the country, enabling and empowering communities to take decisions, which I think is a good thing. I think most people would agree that that is a good thing. And I would hope that local authorities would agree that that's a good thing eh, as well. And furthermore, we're providing support and, eh, around communities of interest as well. Glasgow Disability Alliance published the Action Research Budgeting for Equality report and are helping people ensure that people with disabilities can also eh, take part in these important decisions. And I think that's the key thing, is making sure that everybody gets a chance to have a say and how decisions are made where they live because those are oftentimes better decisions for the community. Question six, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet North Ayrshire Council. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Uh, ministers and officials will continue to regularly meet representatives of all Scottish local authorities, including North Ayrshire Council, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. On the 24th of August, I met with representatives of North Ayrshire Council at Adrossan Academy to announce the rollout of free sanitary products across all schools, colleges and universities in Scotland. One of those representatives included the then Chief Executive, Elma Murray, who is set to retire soon, and I'd like to put on record my thanks to her for her unstinting commitment to the people of North Ayrshire and her commitment to public life. Yeah. Jamie Green. I uh, thank the Minister for that response. Can I place on record, too, my thanks to Elma Murray and wish her uh, successor uh, the very best of luck uh, in that role. Uh, but the reality is that, like many local authorities, North Ayrshire Council has been on the receiving end of Scottish Government cuts in recent years. In the last Scottish budget, it saw a £5 million reduction in its funding. I'm glad Mr Gibson thinks this is funny. Given that we now know that the Scottish Government's block grant is going up, would the Minister agree with me that there is really no justification for further cuts to North Ayrshire's budget? Cabinet Secretary. It, it might be Halloween. He's certainly had a nightmare with that uh, supplementary uh, <laughs> presiding <laughs> officer um, because despite the rhetoric from the Conservatives, austerity is far from over. In fact, we continue to experience the cuts of the UK uh, government. Our uh, resource block grant has been cut and will almost be £2 billion lower in real terms for 2019-20 compared to 2010-2011. That's the reality of the fact for yeah. Jamie Green and he should recognise that this government continues to treat local government fairly but he has to realise and look a bit closer to home for where the cuts start. Yeah. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. Minister, when you next meet North Ayrshire Council, will rates be discussed? Last week, Mr Green claimed that North Ayrshire businesses pay 65% more than the rest of Scotland, with payments of £225 million, and that non-domestic rates income should increase by the consumer price index rather than the retail price index. Can the Minister confirm that the North, North Ayrshire's non-domestic rates income was in fact £41.665 million in 2016-17? The businesses pay the same uh, NGRIs play, as the rest please. of Scotland, then the current financial year of CPI is being used, and that Mr Green needs to do his homework on such matters before attacking the Scottish Cabinet Government. Secretary. 
Mr Green has a continued run of nightmares in the way he articulates points of view. I can confirm to Mr Gibson that businesses in North Ayrshire pay the same level of non-domestic rates as those in other authorities across Scotland and it's simply nonsense to suggest that they pay 65% more. They're also currently benefiting from the most generous package of rates reliefs currently available in the UK with stats published only this morning confirming that over 3,000 businesses in North Ayrshire are estimated to benefit from our small business bonus scheme in 2018-19. A benefit worth £5.8 million to the local economy. I'm sure Mr Gibson will make good use of those good, positive facts and figures. Yeah. Question 7, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what role local government will have in implementing the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board's strategic plan. Cabinet Secretary. The Strategic Board is an independent board and will develop its own plans for how to engage with local government in implementing its strategic plan. The board's membership includes local government and COSLA representation and ministers expect the board to ensure local government continues to be fully involved and engaged. The Scottish Government therefore supports the board's stated commitment to ongoing engagement including with local government. Ministers believe that local government is an essential element of the good governance of Scotland and remain committed to working closely with COSLA and other local government interests. John Scott. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer, but um, local government is mentioned twice in the 47-page document, which then presents a complex structure for shaping skills development, and there's a real risk of confusion over the role of local authorities. Can I therefore ask the government what specific actions it will take to make local influence and in skills development stronger, not weaker, and what role local authorities will play in this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, again, you know, I, I reiterate the fact that the membership of this board includes uh, local government and COSLA representation. So at the very heart of, where, of the decision making and the very heart of that board includes local government. And I'll we'll continue to expect that, uh, that that board continues to ensure that local government continues to fully contribute, is fully involved and fully engaged. We, are, along with our partners in local government, have a joint governance role across Scotland. It's important that it, when there's economic uh, and enterprise and skills uh, on the agenda that local government continues to be involved and continues to have an active role. And that is ex exactly what we expect from uh, the Strategic Board's plan. Question 8, Monica Lennon. Refer to my register of interest, presiding officer, as I am a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that planning policies and decisions do not discriminate against minority groups. Minister. Uh, officer, under existing legislation, uh, ministers and planning authorities are required to perform their statutory functions in a manner which encourages equal opportunities. The planning bill also includes provisions to ensure that all members of the public have a greater say in planning the future of their places. Monica Lennon. I thank the Minister for that answer. Travelling show people often live in caravans or mobile homes and when development is proposed on neighbouring sites it's important that impacts like noise and vibration are taken, are, take account of the different types of accommodation uh, that could be affected. Does the Minister agree with me that planning policies and decisions should help to protect and facilitate the traditional way of life of travelling show people and is he satisfied that current planning guidance and practice is adequately protecting travelling show people. Minister. Um, President officer, I spoke at some length this morning uh, about gypsy travellers and show people um, at the uh, uh, scrutiny of stage two of the planning bill. Uh, the quality of our places matter to all of us uh, and planning has a responsibility uh, to ensure that the needs of all of our communities are understood and met. Uh, planning can play a vital role uh, ensuring that gypsy travellers have safe and secure places to stop or settle. Uh, I'm absolutely committed to ensuring that gypsies and travellers are properly involved in pl the planning of the future of their places. Um, and as I said to um, Ms Lennon, presiding officer, and other members of the planning committee uh, this morning, and it's uh, open to all members, if they want to know what the Scottish Government is doing at this moment in time in terms of research to get this right, I'm more than happy to provide that information. Question 9, Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it's ensuring that housing built as part of its affordable and social house building programme contributes to a low carbon future. Minister. All projects funded through the Scottish Government's affordable housing supply programme are required to meet current building standards. 
Over and above this uh, requirement, a higher level of grant is available for homes built to a higher, greener standard. Uh, new homes in Scotland are now producing around 75% less carbon dioxide emissions than the homes built to the 1990 standards. Uh, looking at energy performance certificates issued for new homes, 95% of them achieve an A or B rating for environmental impact. Julian Martin. Thank the Minister for that answer. Can the Minister update Parliament and the Government's thinking on three issues that will drive down carbon emissions? The potential to set a net zero carbon standard for new buildings through the use of carbon offsetting measures, measures, enabling infrastructure for the charging of electric vehicles in new buildings, and ensuring all new builds are as energy efficient as technology will allow, reducing the need for future retrofitting. Minister, briefly, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, on a net zero carbon standard for new development, we are investigating this as part of our current review of building regulations. Um, and we launched the Plugged In Households Initiative on the 19th of October. This aims to widen access to um, electric vehicles, including through housing associations and car clubs, so that communities across Scotland can share the benefit. And on uh, the last matter, a review of the energy standards set by building regulations started earlier this year. Uh, this includes a focus on reducing energy demand and will consider the extent to which it is practical to future-proof new buildings to support further change, such as the decarbonisation of the heat that we use in our buildings. Thank you. I have to move on to the next set of portfolio questions. I apologise to Gil Patterson, the only member we didn't manage to reach. Social Security questions. Question one, Rachel Hamilton, please. Scottish Government, what action it is taking to reduce levels of social, social isolation amongst older people? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. By the end of the year, we will publish our final social isolation and loneliness strategy. Our draft strategy was published in January 2018 and identified that older people should feature as a prominent group within the final strategy as we recognise that they are at more of risk of being affected by social isolation and loneliness. I have recently been meeting with a wide range of stakeholders and partners on the details of the final strategy and last week we published the analysis of the consultation responses. In addition, we have included a new national indicator in the national performance performance framework. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Minister for that response. Social isolation is likely to cost the NHS as much as £12,000 per year and can be as significant a risk factor for early death as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Due to lower levels of connectivity, it is also very likely that those who live in rural areas may experience isolation and loneliness. Given this high burden on the NHS, may I ask the Scottish Government what steps they are taking to combat social isolation, particularly in rural areas? Uh, uh, Minister, please. Yeah, we're, we're working on all of those aspects of, of the, all of the impact, especially on, on rural uh, uh, strategies as well. One of these um, um, aspects and key themes that are emerging right now is about rural connectivity and rural transport projects. And I had a really lovely visit uh, with the presiding officer to Galloway Wheels a few weeks ago, which was a great example of that. There's a real key element to the work that we are doing on social isolation and loneliness about connecting people and especially looking at rural areas and how we can work uh, together collaboratively to, to answer those questions. Question two, Alison Harris. <clears throat> Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the estimates for social security spending in the Scottish Fiscal Commission's 2018 economic and fiscal forecasts. Cabinet Secretary. As set out in the Scottish Fiscal Commission Act 2016, the Scottish Fiscal Commission's independent forecasts of devolved social security expenditure are used to inform the Scottish Government's budget. The Scottish Fiscal Commission will publish their next report, Scotland's Economic and Fiscal Forecasts, including updated forecasts for social security expenditure on the 12th of December to accompany the Scottish Budget for 1920. Alison Harris. Thank, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. In the past, Ministers have sometimes hinted that they don't agree with the Scottish Fiscal Commission's forecast. Last year, for example, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance argued that the Scottish Fiscal Commission were more cautious than the Scottish Government on income tax forecasts. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore confirm if the Scottish Government has any plans to do any of its own modelling or projections of welfare spending at all, or can she confirm it will always use the Scottish Fiscal Commission Cabinet figures? Secretary. 
but we do have um, a, a team of officials that uh, do work exactly on um, forecasting and they also work very closely and share their information with the Swarish Fiscal Commission due that. So our modelling and forecasting um, as a government um, has been there right from the beginning of the social security process. The Scottish Fiscal Commission's um, uh, forecasting is what has to be used for the budget. It is, uh, I accept, challenging to forecast uh, what the expenditure uh, will be on some of the social security assets because this is uh, a new power to Scotland and we are delivering, for example, Best Start grants, which um, are new, and we're also encouraging take-up more than the current Westminster system. But uh, the member can be assured that the Scottish Government officials uh, do work very closely with the Fiscal Commission and share all their forecasting and modelling information. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary has said in recent written answers that um, the Scottish Government could be paying over £2.5 million pounds to the DWP to deliver Scottish choices and that the full year cost of delivering carers allowance by the DWP will cost the Government £5.9 million. Is the Cabinet Secretary able to set out how much uh, she expects to pay the DWP over the course of the remainder of this parliament to deliver Scotland's devolved benefit powers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Mr Griffin is uh, quite right to, to point out that um, we do have to um, pay the DWP for the choices, uh, like Scottish choices, that we want to make. And, for example, when we're looking at split payments um, in universal credit, that will be another um, aspect um, that we will need to look at. Um, the information for the parliamentary term, I don't have at the moment, because obviously we're still negotiating with the DWP. And, for example, around split payments, we need to um, establish um, what we would like to see as the Scottish Parliament before we then enter negotiations um, and very detailed negotiations with the DWP, but I'll be sure uh, to keep uh, the Parliament um, and particularly the member um, up to date with our work on that process. Question three, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what support it can give to older people who find themselves lonely and isolated. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. We are supporting a range of initiatives to tackle social isolation and loneliness amongst older people. This includes funding for the Age Scotland Helpline, support for the development of men's sheds and support for a range of local community-based projects which bring older people together to spend time with each other. I look forward to building on this further with an older people's framework, which we will launch in 2019, to help focus on promoting a positive image of older people, tackling prejudice and, un and, and ensuring older people's voices are recognised in decisions around their services. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Minister. I think the Minister may be aware of the Bell Grove Hotel in my constituency, which is effectively a private hostel with a lot of older, lonely and isolated people. It is believed that the hostel management intercept the mail of the residents, and that makes them even more lonely and isolated. Can she say if there's anything that the government can do for these residents? Minister. Okay, Mr Mason is right, I'm well, well aware of the Belgrove Hotel, but can, uh, um, I, I say to him that any interception of another person's mail without their consent is a criminal activity and such should, these concerns should be reported to the police. Um, as the member is aware, the Belgrove Hotel is a privately owned hotel um, hostel and not typical of the homelessness accommodation in Glasgow. And if the member can give me more details of his constituents' concerns, I would be happy to pass these on to the housing ministers. Homelessness is a clear example of how a person can become so isolated and loneliness and it is an, ar an area where we are taking real interest in and in recognizing the needs during the process of the strategy. Question four, Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it defines older people. Be careful, Minister. <laughs> Minister. <laughs> Presiding officer, the Scottish Government focuses mainly, not, but not exclusively, on the over 50s, while recognising the importance of removing barriers to a positive ageing for everyone. This age is chosen because for many it is a point of, at which life circumstances start to change in ways that have implications for the future. For example, in relation to working pa patterns, caring responsibilities and long-term health conditions. As I mentioned earlier, Presiding Officer, we will publish the Older People's Framework next year, which, will develop an older, uh, which has been developed alongside older, pe older people's organisations, and it will cover combating negative stereotypes and celebrating <laughs> the contribution that all <laughs> citizens can make, whatever their age. I don't know if Ms Fabiani is happy with that definition, Ms Fabiani. Can, can I say, presiding officer, I hadn't realised till now that our minister was actually elderly. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, some of us are positively ancient. 
Um, <laughs> could I suggest that that perhaps be looked at as part of the strategy? Because I'm, I'm sure that there's very few 50-year-olds that feel they're elderly. However, having said that, uh, in that people are um, living longer lives these days, I, I have now you know, seen quite often a serious problem in East Kilbride where you have very elderly carers who are looking after daughters and sons with um, disabilities or learning difficulties, and they're in fact elderly themselves. And I feel that's a very particular kind of caring, um, needs a different kind of approach and very special consideration. Now, th there is a group in, in my own constituency of East Kilbride that many in this parliament are aware of, who've done a lot of work over, on this over the years, and I would ask that the minister would come and hear firsthand what some of the issues are. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. If only I could rescind the cake that Miss Fabiani ate at my significant birthday party recently, I would be taking it back off her. Anyway, she makes a, a, a very important point about carers, and we all know that all carers now have rights under the Carers Act to have their individual needs and personal outcomes identified. For the first time, they also have the right to support for any identified needs which meets the local eligibility criteria. A major focus of these new rights is that support, information and advice for carers should be tailored to the individual circumstances and characteristics, including any needs due to their, to their age. And I would be absolutely delighted to visit Ms Fabiani and her constituents in East Kilbride. Question five, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what support it can provide in response to the reported increase in rent arrears amongst universal credit recipients in the Mid-Scotland and Fife region. Cabinet Secretary. We expect to spend over £125 million in 2018-19 on welfare mitigation and on measures to help protect those on low incomes. This includes more than £60 million in funding for discretionary housing payments, of which over £50 million is to fully mitigate the bedroom tax. As a result of cuts by the UK Government, welfare spending will be reduced in Scotland by £3.7 billion in 2020-2021. The Scottish Government cannot mitigate cuts of that scale. Mounting evidence shows universal credit claimants are more likely to be in rent arrears and the very limited measures announced in the UK Government's latest budget do not address the fundamental flaws in this discredited system. Yeah. Mark Russell. Can I thank the Minister for that robust answer? We know that in Stirling, even though universal credit was introduced for a few months last year, it led to an increase in rent arrears of 15%, while in Fife there was an 82% increase in crisis grant expenditure as a result of universal credit. It's clear that this policy is providing a huge strain on families and is a vindictive attack on our welfare state. Is the Minister confident that the funds that are available uh, within the constraints of the Scottish Government's budget will be enough to cope with universal credit rollout, particularly the managed migration that will be taking place in the next year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I pointed out in my um, original answer, the scale of the welfare cuts that are coming to Scotland it makes it impossible for the Scottish Government to be able to mitigate that. It is uh, simply uh, uh, too enormous to, to be able to mitigate against that £3.7 billion uh, pounds worth of cuts. Uh, the member is absolutely right to, the point, uh, to, to point out that universal credit is um, an, an, an entirely flawed um, system. Um, the budget was an opportunity to uh, stop the rollout of universal credit, to end the benefit freeze, scrap the absolutely inhumane and indefensible two-child policy and fully reverse cuts to work allowances. Uh, that opportunity was not taken. I spent this morning speaking to constituents um, in Edinburgh um, where universal credit will be rolled out soon and they are frightened of the consequences that are coming down there. It is a shame that the UK government didn't actually respond to that this week. Gillian Martin, briefly, please. What's the reaction of the Cabinet Secretary reports that CFIM, one of Aberdeen's biggest food banks, has warned it may longer, no longer be able to supply other organisations in the northeast of Scotland so that it can cope itself with the full rollout of universal credit in Aberdeen? They've called it a scary time. Cabinet Secretary. Well, it is an extremely um, concerning time and the fact that we are seeing um, increased rent arrears, as Mark Ruskell has pointed to, and also um, the um, extent to which uh, the increased numbers that are going to food banks um, in the areas that have been served by Universal Credit is a testimony to how bankrupt this system um, is. I, I'm very concerned uh, to hear Gillian Martin's um, reports about what's um, going on within her uh, constituency and with that food bank, and I 
fear it may not be the only one in Scotland that will be suffering uh, those demands. Question six, Andy Wales. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what progress it is making with its commitment to recruit up to 250 community-linked workers to work in GP surgeries by the end of this parliamentary session. Cabinet Secretary. Responsibility for community link workers sits within the portfolio of the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. Community link workers continue to form a core component of primary care reform. Our commitment to delivering 250 link workers by 2021-22 is on track. And as part of our support to the new GP contract, the Scottish Government is funding integration authorities to deliver this commitment. Integration authorities have set out how they will do this in their primary care improvement plans. Annie Wells. Thank you. Despite a pledge by the Scottish Government to recruit 250 community link workers by the end of the parliamentary session, last month it was revealed that just three had been recruited in nine months as of September, taking us to a grand total of 56. Not only are we making little headway in terms of numbers, 38 out of the 56 in post are on fixed term contracts, some as little as 18 months. These are vital health workers that can connect people to non-medical no, sources of support in the community. What action will the Minister take to drastically improve this extremely slow progress? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I pointed out in my original answer, um, we um, are on track to deliver our commitment for the 250 uh, workers. Um, Annie Wells is fully aware, I know because of um, written answers that she has received from the Cabinet Secretary for Health around the progress um, in this area, and we are determined to um, fulfil our commitment for that. Maureen Watt, briefly, please. Uh, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary will join with me in congratulating Aberdeen Health and Social Care Partnership, who have concluded a contract with Sam H to provide 20 link workers across all 30 city GP practices uh, for a two-year contract with a one plus one option to the value of £0.7 million. Is this not an example of the money being there and requi it requires the will commitment and drive at a local level to make this happen? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would absolutely um, welcome the, um, the work that has been going on and uh, Maureen was quite right uh, to point to this um, improvement um, and indeed it shows uh, that the government remains on track to fulfil our commitment for 250 um, workers and it's, I'm pleased to hear about the development in the members area. Question 7, Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what budget it expects Social Security Scotland to have for IT for the rest of the parliamentary session. Cabinet Secretary. On the 1st of September 2018, Social Security Scotland became an executive agency of the Scottish Government. The 2018-19 budget for the Agency for IT is expected to be £3.4 million. This budget will grow in future years as systems and processes to support further devolution go live. The outlying business case for the Agency for Social, for Social Security in Scotland was published in April 2017. This estimated cost of the Social Security Agency at a steady state of between £100 44 million and 156 million pound per annum. Social Security Scotland Devolution is a complex and multi-year programme of activity. This process is not yet complete with systems and processes currently being developed and the Social Security Agency will not reach a steady state until welfare devolution is complete. Liam Kerr. Thank the Minister for that answer. This is a huge undertaking and after the SNP's failures on cap funding, police IT, NHS 24 and I could go on, people will be very nervous. So can the Minister tell us specifically what lessons were learned from these to ensure the new system will work? Cabinet Secretary. Well, indeed, the Audit Scotland report, which um, looked at uh, a number of public sector um, projects in relation to IT um, and has looked at what is going on within Social Security and uh, the new powers that are coming to the Scottish Parliament, has said that we are making um, good progress um, within Social Security Scotland and our uh, programme. We recognise that this is, of course, um, a complex area. It is the biggest um, change to devolution since this Parliament was set up. Uh, that's why we are pleased with our progress uh, that remains um, on time and the, the progression that we're making with uh, Social Security Scotland uh, can only um, go well if we have a good cooperation from the DWP and I hope that the member will encourage the DWP to remain with their commitments on IT because that will ensure that we deliver our timetable. Question 8, Jeremy Balfour. 
Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what measures are in place to protect vulnerable older people from bogus callers and rogue traders. Minister. Uh, thank you. The Scottish Government is committed to protecting and supporting vulnerable older people. We continue to work with Police Scotland, Trade and Standards and partners including Neighbourhood Watch and Crime Stoppers to help raise awareness, provide practical advice and encourage the reporting of any suspicious activity. Following a report by the Nuisance Calls Commission to empower and protect individuals, we have implemented, implemented an action plan to protect people from scam callers. This includes the funding for call blocking units to vulnerable customers. And we have also implemented preventative measures through the nominated Neighbour Scheme to help build resilience and encourage communities communities to look after each other. Jeremy Balfour, briefly, please. Uh, thank the Minister for response. Sadly, doorstep scammers commonly target older people. Only last week, an 86-year-old lady from Livingston lost hundreds of pounds through trade bogus traders caught her home. Would the Minister therefore commit to having further discussions with her justice colleagues on this issue to consider additional awareness for raising campaigns, particularly on darker nights? Minister. Yeah, absolutely. A, a, a great point to bring up. We, as, as the member will know, Crime Stoppers lead a national doorstep crime campaign. If in doubt, keep them out. And there's many other aspects of the work we do along with Police Scotland and other organisations. But I'm happy to, to brief my uh, justice colleagues and see how we can make progress on this issue. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. And I apologise to Joan McAlpine and Alexander Stewart, who we did not reach. We then have to move on to the next side of business. Time is very tight and you have two short debates. So... I'm not going to really pause. I'm just going to fill in time by singing or talking or while you get your seats. Mr. Green, please, we've got to move on. <laughs>